We are calling this session to order as promised on time because we learned from the morning session that if we're not on time, everything runs off schedule. Um, welcome back. Welcome back, those of you that made it uh, to the tour of Gettysburg. If you just got back, I know you're probably just cooling off, but I heard it was absolutely amazing. Did you all enjoy that? Yeah? Oh, what an amazing opportunity. So amazing to see um, you all coming back. would love to hear about that because we weren't able to attend. Um, we have a really, really incredible uh, plenary three for you. Um, but before we jump to that, just a really quick recap of plenary two, because we had such incredible conversations in our first group of breakouts. Um, well, what breakouts did you get a chance to look at? I went to the, um, the one with Tavis Smiley and, and uh, Ian Rowe here in the, in the main ballroom, uh, polarization. Um, in the black community. In, in the black community. And uh, yeah, what an incredible conversation that was. Two very instrumental figures in, in that space. And uh, yeah, just very informative, very, uh, very good. It was, it was led by our great friend, John Wood Jr. Um, and uh, yeah, what an incredible conversation that was. That one could have probably filled a day or two on itself, I think, right, John? <laughs> just a <the> conversation about <laughs> reparations, I think would have lasted a couple more hours. Yeah, but it stayed civil. And uh, again, it's about having conversations, right, with people that, that we, we don't necessarily agree with, but, but conversations that we can have in a civil way. Have a, having those conversations, getting to know more about both sides of the issue and, and, and doing so through curious conversations, it just makes sense. It just makes sense. And what I loved about it, I actually got to go to that one as well. I was very curious and I appreciated that it showed this perspective. You had three African-American men on the stage with very different opinions about some of the same issues, and it spoke the duality and maybe the plurality of the conversations that we can all be having and the way that people think, um, and the way that we can come to this room, this, this space, thinking about who else can we bring in? What other ideas, viewpoints, people, colors, faces can we bring in? And so certainly something that I'm looking at as we go through the next few days is looking at who's not in this room and looking at what conversations we should be having, very difficult ones, with people that maybe aren't, don't look like us, think like us, or maybe do, but you make an assumption that if because I am African-American, I have a blue tag, that every African-American in this room is gonna have a blue tag. That's not true, right? And it was fantastic and really, really um, eye-opening for me to see such an amazing uh, conversation and dialogue and debate um, around yeah. issues that matter. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the Q&A &A portion of that, that was also fantastic. I mean, you know, people from the audience bringing to the table some very important questions um, and then getting some very different answers and, yeah. and different answers that, that they probably didn't quite expect, um, but great answers nonetheless. So, And that is what I think you can expect for the rest of uh, the day, certainly, and hopefully what you got a little out of in your other breakouts too. We're going to try and make the rounds to a few others over the afternoon um, as well, but we definitely want to make sure um, that we get um, as much content as we can in every plenary and certainly as much dialogue uh, either at lunch and at dinner and all of the times that we have to, to kind of network with each other. Right. So to uh, uh, to start off, we'll just we'll just find out real quick. Is there any logistical announcements, Kieran? Anything that we need to? Oh, actually, April. April. I'm sorry. Any any announcements that we need to do before? Uh... Oh, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm taking over Kieran's announcements uh, for this one Great. just to save time. Um, and the first one is uh, we need people to fill the entire rows. In the last session, several people had to stand because there were seats in the middle. So if you see seats next to you or you're sitting on the end, we want you to scoot in. There are a lot of people still coming back from the dining room. This will really help them. Yes, yeah, this would be great easy. for everybody who's late for lunch. I know you guys were the good ones. You were on time. Yes. But. Hey, one thing, April, that I noticed, the cards didn't get picked up. I don't know if, if people want to, like, pass all the cards down to the end of the roll. And... Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Um, so I'm going to give you just a little overview um, I know you're all meeting your new neighbors, but I just am going to make some announcements you might want to hear. Um, it's your choice if you'd rather be lost, up to you. Um, 
But so uh, what will happen after this is we will go, it'll be like the last one in that I'll give you directions to the breakouts at the end. There will be people you can follow to the rooms. Um, and so then after the breakouts, there will be from 4.15 to 6.15, there's a break um, that where there are also some optional what are called special gatherings in that time. There are a bunch of them advertised on Whova on the app. So um, check there if you're looking for something. And... Uh, then after that, so dinner is at 6.15, and then the evening events will start at 7.30 sharp. And so you all are the people who managed to be on time, so I'm not actually worried about you guys. Really, you're just going to have to listen to me talk about, talk to the people who are not in the room. But just as a warning, we're going to start, like, actually at 7.30. So make sure you get to the dining hall at 6.15 and, like, try to... Um, uh, to eat so that you don't miss the first part of, for example, the play. And the locations for tonight are uh, Wilk and Francis, you, and Francis Collins, who's here somewhere, um, will be moderated by Erica here. Maybe. Oh, maybe. Maybe. Amy. I'm we back. We may have our original Martha back. Oh, well, by Amy. We're hoping <laughs> um, she's back. She's great. Uh, there will be a premiere debate. Um, which anyone who wants to should come to. Uh, actually, you should go to what's in your packet. Uh, Kieran will kill me if I don't say that, but I'll, I want you to come to the debate. Anyway, um, on whether America is the greatest country in the world, that will be in the atrium, which again is across the street in the dining hall building. And then there's the four score memory play in the Klein Theater, which is all the way across campus. And so for that, um, probably the best thing to do is just stop by the info desk, if that's what you're supposed to go to, to make sure you know how to get there. Uh, I think that's all for now. Um, yes, cool. Great. Well, welcome to um, what should be an incredibly exciting plenary because it captures one of the most exciting things happening in our movement right now, and that is the, uh, the rise of Gen Z and the next generation. So yes, yes, that, absolutely, yes. Um, so uh, I'd like to invite um, Actually, we'll start with the Bridge USA video. This is three minutes. It's one of the best videos I've ever seen. Enjoy. Why are we here? We are on the cutting edge, the cutting edge of politics. We have 28% liberal students, we have 28% conservative students, and we have 44% independent slash undecided folks. That is an insane statistic because that is literally the division in the country, which is amazing. It's an ideologically representative sample. These types of gatherings don't exist. Bridging the gap between two major divides in this country. And what, who better to tackle that than the next generation of students? conservative versus liberal versus authoritarian versus libertarian. I think there's a lot more opportunity for people to find that common ground than we realize in society today. We represent generations of change makers working toward the greatness of this nation that lies beneath the smokescreen of our most tumultuous conflicts and ugly scars. We are the new change makers and it's our responsibility to finish the job of our predecessors. I'm grateful to live in a country that's home to a stable democracy with regular elections that stands for justice. I believe a country's greatness is measured by how well it serves its citizens and provides them with opportunities for growth. How much of success is really opportunity based and how much of success comes from being able to have opportunities that not everyone else has. In and of ourselves, America is an echo chamber. We only listen to people who have our opinions and the whole point of Bridge is to do the complete opposite of that. We weren't meant to be here. We were just a few ragtag kids with a naive idea that people from different sides of the political spectrum could actually get together and discuss. Whatever issues we care about, criminal justice, uh, abortion, free speech, religion, faith, freedoms, gun control, um, all of those issues require us to be able to listen, engage, and hear each other. I always feel the need for people to engage, for people to discuss, for people to engage in dialogue regardless of their differences. We see young people leading change so much nowadays and 
I think this is the perfect place to have these difficult conversations. This is how we get better at that. This is how we make our democracy better, and it's how we uh, make our country better and a better place to live. It is about you. It is not about me. 50 chapters, we started with five. We've got hundreds of thousands of dollars now ready to mobilize our movement. We started with like 10 in our first discussion. We were in one state, now we're in 22. All under the age of 25. It is possible. It is within you. All right. Yes, yes. Yes. You're gonna see some of those folks up here in just a few minutes. Um, so fun fact, approximately one in 10 people at this convention is a student. And yeah, I see you, I see you, yes. Um, and so we're just gonna take a couple minutes and a couple different times throughout this plenary, hear thoughts from some students who are here. So Carson and Alethea, if you would come up, um, we'll start with you and grab a mic on your way. All right, welcome to the stage. So I just have a couple questions for you. I'd like each of you to answer um, sort of who are you? Uh, what school do you go to, that kind of thing? And why are you here at the 2023 Braver Angels Convention? Alethea, we'll start with you. Um, so I'm Alethea Underheil and I'm a history major at Dakota Wesleyan University. Um, so I discovered Braver Angels through my wonderful professor and the amazing job that Braver Angels is doing at campuses with their um, debates. And so I, as a young student, um, became very captured by Braver Angels through their commitment in fostering constructive dialogue and um, bridging the political divide in America. So um, growing up, um, I realized that you know, especially in today's um, climate in America, realizing that this is the situation I'll have to live and um, deal with, I think that it's only wise that I get involved as soon as I can in um, depolarizing America. Um, there's a quote that I really want to share. It's by U.S. Senator, also a Union General, um, Carl Schurz, and I think his quote really fits with um, Braver Angels. It's, um, my country, right or wrong, if right, to be kept right, if wrong, to be set right. So that's why I'm at this convention. All right, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I am Carson Brunn. I'm a junior at Point Park University in downtown Pittsburgh. I'm majoring in broadcast production and media management. I have, <laughs> I have fans. Uh -huh. uh, you do have fans. <laughs> I found Bridge USA through social media. Uh, I think the summer of 2020 was a big wake-up call for a lot of people, but particular for, particularly for me. I think I saw how cynical a lot of people got and how easily people turned on each other whenever things got bad, especially in the world of politics. And I found Bridge USA through social media, and I just fell in love with it. And I fell in love with the idea that this problem doesn't have to define our culture or our generation. And I found Bridge USA, I found Brave Angels through Bridge USA, and I was just so excited to be able to be in these spaces with people, seeing that a lot of our work is virtual. And I think these sort of meetings are really important because it's hard to imagine the scale of it when you're looking through a computer screen. Absolutely. Yes, I think we can all agree that in person's really good. Yes, thank you. All right, so then my other question for each of you is what do you think Gen Z has uniquely to contribute to this work? Either of you can start. Sure, go ahead. Um, so for me, I think that my generation, um, especially with today's technology, has the best ability to communicate much faster and much further than any generation before us. And so I think that my generation is uniquely good at being able to spread Braver Angels' word as far as possible and as quickly as possible to everyone. 
Awesome. We already found you in, in South Dakota, so yeah. that's that's definitely a good recommendation. I say as someone from a rural state, no offense. Go ahead. I think that piggybacking off of um, what Alethea said is that I think older generations adopted technology, but we were born in it. I hear like the term digitally native get thrown around a lot. And I think that we have a bit of self-awareness on how that technology can be used to manipulate our discourse and also how we can flip it to try to help the movement. And I also think that, uh, like was mentioned on stage last night, this isn't the first time that our politics have been really tribal, but I think we are facing a really like juiced up version of it. Like we're, we have social media affecting us, we have the world getting a lot smaller. And so I think just being in that unique situation is gonna force us to come up with some new solutions. Wonderful. Big round of applause for Carson and Althea. Thanks. Put the button. So you've been hearing the word Bridge USA, and for those of you who don't know who Bridge is, you're about to be very impressed. I'd like to invite to the stage Ross Irwin, the Chief Operating Officer of Bridge USA, yes, to tell you all about it. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Yeah, you good. It's a little warm, right? I'm a little sweaty, I gotta be honest. Anyone else a little warm? <laughs> no, no, yeah. I got news for you. There was another convention that was pretty warm. Convention in the summer of 1787. Woo. And they wrote the document that still governs this country. We got AC people, I think we can do this thing. <laughs> In all seriousness, though, I just want to give a huge shout out to April, to the students, to the students coming up, and a huge round of applause for the Braver Angels team. I also, as a member of Gen Z, my speaking notes are on my mobile phone. Um, I'm not on Twitter or Instagram. I swear, it's for work. As I was thinking about how I was going to, to write this presentation, I was thinking about maybe I can tell you kind of how we build our chapters or how we support our chapters or, you know, what the specifics are, what the financials are. And it just, it just was not clicking. It just wasn't working. And I was realizing that's not why I'm here, right? I'm not here because of the specifics or the, you know, the action items, right? Like, I'm here because of my heart. I was born in a small rural town of Sonora, California. It's about 4,000 people. Um, and I grew up my whole life there. It's a very small town. Everyone knows you. You know everyone else. And when I started telling people that I got accepted to UC Berkeley, they looked at me a little strange. <laughs> they, they, I mean, some people literally said, I don't think you should go. I think it's dangerous. I think those people are crazy and they're evil and they're stupid. And then I got down to Berkeley and I told them about where I grew up. <laughs> they said, you're not backwards and racist and terrible, <laughs> but all those people you, you grew up with those people are crazy, they're evil, they're stupid. And it hit a chord in my heart because I've always loved to, to bring people together, right? Um, people who are different, who, who have commonalities and watch them get along despite those differences. And I realized that two groups of people, two communities that I loved and that I knew wanted the best for the world and the people in it hated each other. They didn't even know each other, but they hated each other. And so that's when, when my heart woke up to a problem. And Milo Yiannopoulos came to my campus and uh, we started, we decided there's gotta be a better way and help start Bridge USA. Um, but what I wanna talk to you about is the heart of Bridge USA, because the heart of Bridge USA and Braver Angels is very similar. And that's why we have to work together to create this movement right, to begin what we see here in this convention and to take it on for years to come. So what is the heart of Bridge USA? We have three 
core values. First one is viewpoint diversity, and you see it in this room. You have to have access to different points of view if you want to know about the world, if you want to be informed, right? If you want to make smart decisions in your lives, in your families, in your businesses, and especially in your politics. So you've got access to, to different points of view. What do you do with them? Well, this country, and some would argue the world, have forgotten how to interact with that person that's different from us. And so our second value is constructive engagement. And what that means, it's very simple, is do you know how to listen and do you know how to speak? Can you listen to someone that you dislike, that you find amoral, right, whose views that you think are backwards? And can you communicate with a person in a way that they can actually hear you, right? That's what we teach. That's what we do at Bridge USA. And it brings us to our third, final value, the third heartstring of Bridge USA, which is a solution-oriented politics. It's all about fighting right now, and you all know that, right? People are angry, and it's not... People are angry, and sometimes you need to be angry. The problem is the anger, the, the, the small wins, the dunking on people on CNN or Fox, right? The mean tweets, that's the end goal, right? It's not to get to a solution for Americans. It's not to work together. Um, to be mean and divisive and hateful is the goal. And so what we want to do, what we're doing at Bridge USA is we're bringing a bunch of people into the room who disagree with each other. We're teaching them how to talk to one another. And we're getting them thinking about how do I create solutions in my politics? And how do we actually get people to talk to each other? These are our four norms of discussion, um, and they really are the bread and butter of what Bridge USA does. Throughout the country, students, chapters are meeting every, every week, every two weeks, to have discussions about every kind of issue, from abortion to immigration to economics to, is a hot dog a sandwich? <laughs> And we're using these four norms of discussion. The first one is a good rule for life. Don't interrupt or have side conversations. Second rule is listen to listen rather than listening to respond. So much with what we do, I'm, I'm guilty of it, you know, especially if my, my parents are talking to me or something. As soon as they say something wrong, right, you're like, I'm going to get you for that one, right? And you've shut them out. you stop listening. You have to listen with the purpose of understanding someone. Our third norm is to critique the perspective, not the person. You might have heard the Latin word, ad hominems, right? Instead of saying, April, me, that's a bad, you're, you're a bad person for that idea. Say, April, I don't like that idea. I think it's a bad idea. We take out her value as a human being, her morality, Right? And we talk about the ideas instead of the humans that, are, that hold them. And then the final thing is that we can never represent whole groups we belong to. I cannot speak for all men. I cannot speak for all white people. And I shouldn't be expected to. Right? I can say, hey, in my experience as a man, I've felt this way. But we will never ascribe attributes of a group to an individual, and we will never expect them to speak for their entire group. That's it. That's Bridge USA in like seven points. <laughs> and it's working. It's resonating in the hearts of a lot of people, a, a shocking amount of people. When we started it, we thought, yeah, we'll throw together some discussions. And more and more people began to say, hey, I want that to happen. Um, we're now at 50 high school chapters, 20 high school chapters, and since the video you just saw, one more state. <laughs> we're actually in 23 states. Um, it's working. We're growing quickly. And we want to get more students in, right? And what we want to do is we want to work with Braver Angels and all the amazing organizations in this room 
to create this movement together, right? To get more students in, to get more people into Braver Angels, to get more people in this all together. Because there are many people out there who don't know about what's going on in this room right now, and we need to get them here. So to help, to help grow this movement, very simple. If you are a student, please start a chapter. We can talk about it, and we will help you create these conversations at your campus. If you know a student, reach out to them. Send them our, our website, right? Send them to me. My email is irwin at bridgeusa.org. You can email all of me. Um, but if you don't know a student, share, like, follow. I am a firm believer this movement has to be loud on social media. Increasingly, public opinion is being shaped and formed on, on social media. We have to be in that fight, right? So like, retweet. Anyone here, you see, hey, are you on Twitter? Are you on Instagram? Let's boost each other up. Right? Let's create a network of people online who are fighting for a better way to converse, a better way to engage, a better way to argue. TikTok. <laughs> Just leave TikTok, Don. <laughs> um, and if you don't have socials, you can't start a chapter, you can always financially support a chapter, which we would be super grateful for. But overall, I just want to say a big thank you to the Braver Angels team and more importantly to every single one of you here because you took time out. You could be sitting at home. You could be watching TV, right? You could be kicking back. Instead, we're sitting here in a hot convention room thinking about what is the future of America. So let's do it. All right, very good. Thank you, Ross. Yes, excellent. Um, so now you're going to hear from another couple of students. Uh, um, Claire and Anthony, come on up. So same as last time, I have a couple questions for you. Uh, the first one is, so tell us who you are. Um, and tell us what you're most proud of in this work. All right, um, I'm Claire Ashcraft. I go to Capital University in Ohio. I study uh, philosophy and creative writing. And what I'm most proud of is the persistence that it takes to do this work. Um, I first got into it because my dad and I were fighting about politics a lot. And I was a blue at the time and my echo chamber in 2020 was telling me, change his mind or cut him off. He's racist, those are your two options. Um, but I knew he was a good person. I knew that wasn't true and I wasn't gonna do that, but I also wasn't gonna be quiet about things I deeply believed in my own household. So I figured out there, there had to be another way and through that persistence, um, I came to this movement and then I went to college and I saw it there too. Um, we had a vaccine mandate in 2021 and the student newspaper tried to interview people who disagreed with it and they wouldn't take interviews, they said, the students were saying, we're afraid of retaliation from the administration and from our peers. And I looked around and I was like, does no one else see a problem with this? We're, we're in a place of inquiry and people can't give genuine answers to questions. Um, so I started my chapter of Bridge USA and I'm at a very small school and I won't sugarcoat it. There are days I make a really pretty PowerPoint and I put a lot of effort in and no one shows up to our meetings. It happens but I can't stop because small schools don't deserve to get left behind just because they're not the Ivy League. That's, that's not the college environment that I would live in, so I've still got to change it. There's a lot of work to be done. Love it, thank you, Claire. <laughs> now, Anthony, who are you and what are you most proud of in this work? Yeah, I'm Anthony Campos. Um, I'm from California, about 30 minutes east of San Francisco. It's called St. Mary's College of California. It's a small private Catholic school. Um, what I'm most proud of here, I'll, I'll give a little backstory actually. Um, back when Roe v. Wade was slashed down by the, by the Supreme Court, um, there was a bit of chaos that kind of brewed up in my school. Um, there was a lot of like, naturally there was a lot of protests. There was a lot of um, like walkouts, like out of classes, like, of, like regarding Roe v. Wade, um, and with that also came a lot of, um, like the birth of a lot of um, pro-life clubs, 
also. Like, so there's pro-choice protests, there's pro-life clubs popping up. Um, and with that, there was a lot of, um, one day there was a pro-life booth. You know, they, they, they come up with their tent and their table and they had posters, you know, giving information about pro-life and, and why, um, why they believe abortion was bad. Um, and with that came a group of pro-choicers uh, walking up to them and starting to yell at them. You know, yell at them that you're wrong, um, I hate you, like, like you're evil for this, this and that. Um, you know, they're tearing up posters. Um, they were flipping, ta- like they actually did flip their table, you know, mo- like moving, taking all their posters, walking away with them, um, like ridding them of, of, you know, them giving their information. Um, and it was very chaotic. Um, and with it being a small school, um, I knew people from both sides, people both who were, who were out there ripping posters and those um, who, were, who were pro-life, you know. I, I, were friends, I was friends with, with both sides. You know, I knew people, um, and they were friends. I, one of them was my roommate, um, and I was very good friends with them. Um, but it was the fact that neither of them knew each other, and yet they were hating each other, you know, and, and there was, um, and I realized at that point in time, it was kind of like Destiny, that Bridge USA kind of came to me, um, or it, I, I came upon an opportunity of starting a chapter of Bridge USA, and I was thinking to myself, like, this is nowhere, nowhere in the school do we have an, a place, a safe space where people can talk about um, their beliefs and their ideals without being slashed and hate, hated for it. And with that, I, I started a Bridge USA chapter and I went, I moved over from there with me and my vice president. Um, he, I'm not sure where he's out there, but he's out there somewhere. Um, and and we, we started up like, you know, and we started by chapter very small, as it is a small school. Um, there was just five of us. You know, me, him, and three other students that we, we, we already knew, they were both in the politic, political science um, department. So um, it was just three, it was five of us. And it was very small. I mean, I brought up a presentation and I kind of told them about it. And from there, we started making posters and we started going out there, giving posters to people, like standing for hours on end in, in the quads and just giving out posters, talking to people and hoping someone would come in. And we only started in March. And by May, we were already at about 21 people in our chapter. And it was beautiful. <laughs> and it was fantastic because I saw people, like from, from, from the chaotic event of the, pro, of the pro-life booth, um, I saw people from both sides there. And they were talking and, and, and they became friends. They, they, were, they were exchanging ideas and beliefs and I was so proud that we had moved from that chaotic event to you know, genuine, like, human kindness, in a sense. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. All right. So my other question for you both is, what do you most want to say to this movement? Um, well, first of all, we just spent a lot of time talking about how work hard this work is. So the first thing I want to say is congratulations for being here and doing the work that you guys do. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and the second thing is, I know you all know this because you've been in the room where it happens, but we're not sitting in rooms just talking and singing kumbaya. We're not treating these issues like they don't matter just because we're friends after. It's precisely the opposite. It's because these issues matter so, so much that by talking to each other, that's how we get better ideas. We need institutions, higher education institutions that are places of inquiry where students can ask questions and give genuine answers because that's our future and that's how we create change in this country, right? So through doing organizations like this and and talking with each other, that's how we get the change we need to see rather than doing the opposite. Awesome. Uh, Real quick, can I repeat the question? Yeah, um, what would you most like to say to this movement? I think, I definitely say it's, we're not politicians, we're not, you know, higher power authorities, we're normal people, you know, we're, we're out here doing action, like, you know, we're, I'm, just, I'm just a normal student at college, we're, we're workers in, in different careers and different paths, and we're out here making a difference, I think more than what millions could, could do in, in years, and I'm thankful for that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
All right. So I think that people sometimes have the impression that like the younger generation is, uh, oh, I don't know, upstarts or whatever we call them. Um, but I, yeah, couldn't be happier to, to meet the young people I meet in this work. So I'd now like to call to the stage uh, someone who I refer to as Santa Claus because, yes, come up, um, <laughs> my co-director of the College Debates and Discourse Program, Doug Spry. And I call him Santa Claus because he technically doesn't work for Braver Angels. Technically, he works for the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. But he is the gift that keeps on giving. Our program would not be half of what it is without him. And so, yeah, Doug Spry, everybody. He's going to tell us about college debates and discourse with Braver Angels. How about now? Yeah. All right. I'm looking at, there's 675 people I heard that are here, and, and you know how Braver Angels does this thing with fun facts? So every one of us is like a walking encyclopedia of fun facts, and it would be amazing to get all of your fun facts. I'm just going to share one with you, which is, as April said, I work at ACTA. And as you can see, I have a blue lanyard on today. At ACTA, if all my ACTA staff colleagues were here, there are about 30 or 35 of them, they'd all be wearing red ones. So I am living the Braver Angels dream. <laughs> all right. And I mean that in all seriousness because I love my ACTA colleagues. We're very close. And it's been the gift of my life to be somehow uh, mysteriously entered into this process of developing a program with April and Manu and Ross and Bridge USA and my ACTA colleagues. So I want to show you now for the next couple of minutes, I'm going to show you something that usually takes 30, 45 minutes at least, and I'm going to fly through it really quickly because this is a plenary and I don't want to bog you down with too much information. But basically, our program was born in ACTA's conference room when Jonathan Rauch and David Blankenhorn made uh, visits to us and started talking about what then was called Better Angels. Remember that? Yeah. I immediately wanted to get involved personally, just for the same reasons a lot of you wanted to get involved and have gotten involved. So that's where it started for me. But fast forward, somehow miraculously, we have, five years later, a full-blown alliance between ACTA, Braver Angels, and Bridge USA, and we're ideal partners together, and we forged something called the Campus Debates and Discourse Alliance. And five years into it, I think last week we did two more debates at TFAS, right? So it's 182 debates, campus and classrooms, 6,000 students that we know, but there's many more that we haven't been able to count, and there's close to 80 institutions, and more are signing up every week. So the, the range of universities is really a whole footprint of America. American Higher Ed, and come to our website, you'll see all of them. Uh, and the little blue circles, sorry, they're blue, but they really mean. Uh, <laughs> our presence across the country is expanding. We've got some new presence in Utah and the Rockies, which is nice. And there's going to be more circles on that map as we go forward. Okay. So um, hmm, what happened there? Okay, what are Braver Angels debates? I think you all know what they are. I hope you, you are, but to me, they're sacred. They're transformational. April is the architect of it, and I learned it years ago at the first Braver Angels convention I went to in 2018, and I've, it just changed my life. Um, and they're ideal for college students. College students love them. They, they learn the parliamentary style in a few minutes. They jump in, and they're very, very immersive. You're gonna experience Braver Angels debates this weekend multiple times. So one of the pieces, chief pieces, chief, chief pieces of, us, of our success in growing the program is giving ownership to students as much as we can. What do they want their debates to be about? How can we organize? Can we get the, some of them to stand up as opening speakers, et cetera? So by giving the students ownership, it gets a lot of energy, and we have a ground game that starts to build on on campus, but that's completed by having a faculty cohort on campus because faculty are there year after year, students rotate in and out, and you know, but that's the nucleus that we build around when we have a little team on campus of faculty leaders and student leaders together. 
Now, campus debates, that's one form uh, that our program is, is taking shape. And so a campus debate is organized with students, and uh, we've done many, many of them. You know, a lot of them are face-to-face. -face. Some of them are live. Uh, they're basically uh, wonderful. The students just jump in. They ask questions. They make speeches. There's very little pauses or silences. And each one has its own flavor and character, depending on the college community we're working with. And they're equally effective on Zoom. During the pandemic, I thought our program was going to have to hibernate. But instead, it grew in exponentially because um, colleges and universities pivoted to online learning overnight across the entire country. So they started calling us up and said, can we do Braver Angels workshops and debates online? We learned how to do that. Um, we partnered with the National Braver Angels team. And we figured out a way to be very nimble about it. And We've done 60 or 70 of these on the college front, and they're wonderful. So let me show you, take you through um, the month of March and April this past semester. I'm just going to show you five or six slides, but we did about, I think, 15 debates during that time. I was on the road a lot. Sadie, my partner, was on, at, at ACTA was on the road. April was on the road. We were all over the country doing debates on campuses. So this is UNC Greensboro. Uh, we're working hard in North Carolina with the UNC public system and the students and faculty chose a topic in the legislature, you know, the Parents' Bill of Rights. And I know that there are some students from UNC Greensboro here. Stand up if you're here. Anybody? All Let's right. hear it for them. This is one of those, thank you very much, this is one of those miraculous things, just meeting students that I met in March, and some of them got up to speak. They brought, this, brought your child with you. It was an incredible debate. Next slide. So the next night went to UNC Charlotte. And as you, you know, you can get a sense of the headline. These are the topics that students, that are top of mind for students, that they wanted to debate. So a social media topic. And then a, a few nights later, Sadie Webb went to the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and they, had chosen months before a topic on gun control. That morning, unfortunately, a school shooting took place in Nashville, Tennessee. And so there was a great deal of soul searching among the leadership that we were working with. Should we have the debate or not? They decided to go forward with the debate. Sadie chaired it magnificently. And John Wood wrote about it in uh, Newsweek, I believe. And it was on Fox News. Um, it was a pretty amazing, momentous uh, debate for us. A couple more, uh, North Carolina State University, I believe, an abortion topic, two nights later. And then this big one that April and, and Ross were involved with at Utah State University, which we organized with the office of Governor Spencer Cox of Utah. And he came to the debate, right? Yes, he did. And he participated in the debate, which is beautiful. Okay, so then we have another form of debates we do, which is in the classroom. Now, this is something I don't think we expected this in the beginning, but these, class, these debates fall naturally in the classroom as an assignment that a professor can actually give to students for credit, and it was part of their, their learning during the curriculum. So the classroom debates are kind of fueled by this curricular toolkit that we developed with some money from Arthur Vining Davis Foundation. It's written by faculty for faculty. It's got a whole rubric of how to, how to do it, and, and we're refining it. There's going to be a new version of it coming out in early August, so I'll make sure that you all get it. And basically, you know, it's kind of plug and play. It doesn't matter what subject you're teaching. It doesn't matter what size class you have or whether they're sophomores, freshmen, or upper class. Um, you know, it, it, it's very, very malleable. And I'll give you just a couple of quick examples of what's universities have done with professors and students have chosen. So University of Baltimore, a Second Amendment, Cornell University, a science professor, you know, ethical question about genetic engineering. Duke University, a great partner of ours, social media as a threat to democracy or not. Oregon State was an incredible one. This is an economics class, you know, that was studying for the whole semester income inequality. So they decided to debate about that topic. The government being the solution or the problem. <laughs> University of Washington, a huge one on Zoom with 180 students. Uh, that was like a, a, a topic that's in the legislature, another one that they chose. 
and University of Missouri. There's many, many, many more. We've done like, it's just, I've lost count of them. Right, so another thing that's happened that we didn't expect, we got asked to kind of get involved with freshman orientation. Don't you think that like, if you can get freshmen at the first days they get on campus, you have a chance to really change the culture? You think? So that's the idea behind it. So Duke University asked us to come and Bill Doherty helped us design a workshop in 90 minutes that was very immersive. I wanted the students to talk to us more than we talked to them, and it was wonderful. It was about political polarization. And this is with 140 students that came up to Washington. They're studying political science. So this is the topic. They, they chose a topic on uh, political polarization. They talked about their own experiences, and it was just a very immersive workshop. And we've done many debates with Duke. The next week, we went to Denison University, and we had already done three debates there over the last year, and they asked us to come back and actually engage the entire freshman class of 702 students. So April and I and Luke divided ourselves into three auditoriums, and we chaired debates on the same free speech topic. And the thing that kept me up at night was, you know, we have opening speakers, we have faculty, they're gonna be the spark plugs who bring these debates to life, but we've got basically 700 kids coming in from high school, second day on campus. Are they gonna talk in the debate? Or are they gonna sit there like potted plants? <laughs> well, you know what, they were like a fire hose. It was just magnificent. And that was very gratifying. So we actually found, like weeks later, we got an email from a, prof a professor saying, you know, the freshmen in my class are standing up, you know, sharing their political and social viewpoints. This never happened before, you know? So that's what we're going for. Now I'll add, in, it, with regard to Denison, what's happening, they've asked us to come back and do freshman orientation again, but this time they're asking us to train them to do it themselves. So instead of four of us going out there, we're gonna, maybe one of us, we're gonna train them. So I call that uh, freshman orientation 2.0 at Denison. Okay, I'm almost done here. So in order to grow, we're growing so fast, colleges are calling us all the time, our footprint is expanding. We have to you know, increase our staff to the extent that funding allows us to do that. We're training as many uh, young people and faculty to chair debates. So we created an online training course. April is a star of it in many videos. I forced her into a video studio all day in front of a green screen and she did incredible work. And so it's only an hour long, it's fun, it's engaging. Anyone is, is, cap is allowed to take it, but as far as the college debates program, we're trying to be kind of selective and we're you know, giving some personal touch and coaching because we really want to re you know, maintain the quality and the integrity of the, of the college program as it expands. All right, I'm almost done here. So we're foundationally funded. We've gotten in the last couple of years $2 million in funding from various foundations, and the big fish is the John Templeton Foundation which gave us $1.2 million to basically do two things. Research the effects of Braver Angels debates on students. And um, also to see if we could somehow build communities of practice, that's the Templeton word for it. I call them hubs of discourse, whatever you want to call it. It's basically something sustainable as a presence on college campuses. And so, um, there's that slide. So. Um, Professor Lindsay Hoffman is here, and she's gonna be introduced to you, I think, in a moment, but she's leading our research from the University of Delaware, thank goodness. And, um, you know, for the next two year, year and a half, we're gonna be working very deeply with these 10 institutions while we're growing the program around it. All right, so that's it for me, and thank you very much. All right. Thanks so much. Um, don't call me Santa Claus again. <laughs> Can't make that promise, Santa Claus, I'm sorry. Um, so I'd now like to, to bring up, uh, so the, the faculty aspect of our program is actually growing like gangbusters. And that's true in a couple different areas, um, both with classroom debates and we're starting actually to do debates among faculty because they're telling us they need the debates as much or more than their students. So um, I'd like to invite up Dr. Hoffman, who yes, is leading our research, but I'm actually just gonna ask you to uh, share about in, in maybe one minute, I know it's quick, sorry. Um, how, uh, tell us about your experience of this kind of debate in your class. So I came to, oh, hello, hello. Um, 
I came to this, uh, to Braver Angels, uh, largely from a researcher perspective, so it's been really fun to participate in the debates as a faculty member with my students. I've required it in my classes, I've had to, uh, several campus debates, and what this does for students is so empowering for them, um, and it provides them, someone said something earlier about a safe space. I always say that I'm trying to provide a brave space for students to feel comfortable and confident, um, and knowing that we've, we have all these ar arrangements, these rules of, of engagement, and um, they are surprisingly willing and eager, and when it's over, uh, I, we had one debate um, last fall, and when it was over, we were asking if anybody had any questions, and they just, several people said, when's the next one? When can I come to the next one? Um, so it's something that the students have to experience, I think, to really get a good feel for it. And I think as faculty members, I don't know how many others there are here, but um, I think as faculty members, we make it required. We give extra credit. Um, they will show up. So, um, so it's been a great experience, and I'm so excited to be part of the, the research team as well as to have the, the debates on our campus. All right, thank you so much. Yes. Mm -hmm. And speaking of faculty, I also just want to give a shout out to the members of our Scholars Council. If you're here, go ahead and stand. Um, I know that there are at least a few of us. Yeah, that's right. 122 members and growing. And on uh, one other thing about faculty, if you're interested, if you're a faculty member or affiliated with a college or just interested in this um, with regard to the faculty and, and sort of college organization aspect of this, we would invite you to a special gathering, uh, which will be in that break time between 4.15 and 6.15 in Glattfelter 301. And uh, there will actually be a debate you can participate in. So Glattfelter 301, 415 if you're interested. And now I'd like to invite Kayla to the stage to tell us from a student perspective what, um, so you saw a picture of the UNC Greensboro debate and she was there and she's gonna tell us how it was. Welcome Kayla. Hello. <laughs> um, good stage. Um, my name is Kayla Johnston. Like I said, I'm a political science and history major at the University of North Carolina Greensboro. Um, and I didn't really find Braver Angels, it kind of found me. Um, I was looking for a community that, within school, um, that would provide a good venue for having constructive political discourse. And of course, there's, you know, college Democrats, and there was also the YIF, so everybody was kind of split among parties. I was looking for something different where we could all come together and um, speak about issues. There was a club on campus called the Political Awareness Club, um, which had gone defunct because of COVID, and a, the uh, faculty advisor was trying to get that back up and going, um, and I was all for it. Um, unfortunately, the first couple organizational meetings, uh, there was only a, mm, probably five of us that showed up. Um, but the faculty advisor had, um, he had brought up that, Doug, I believe, um, got in contact with uh, Professor McAvoy about doing a Braver Angels debate, and he brought that up in one of the organizational meetings, and we all thought that was a great idea. So, um, you know, I participated in figuring out which issue we're going to cover, and it ultimately uh, landed with the uh, Senate Bill 49, which was the Parents' Rights Bill. Um, and personally, I was not planning on speaking as an opener. Um, but the week before, is the Thursday before, it was, it was uh, scheduled for a Tuesday. And um, word had got out, and there were three people who were willing to speak in the affirmative of the bill, and no one to speak um, in opposition. And so I'm thinking to myself, I really want this to go forward, because I think it's great. It'll be really constructive um, for students on campus. And so I emailed Doug and um, volunteered to speak in opposition. Um, I had been sick that week, so I was like, I'm just going to pull it together and see if I can't, you know, come up with a cohesive argument um, against. Um, and I did. I, I got there and ended up speaking last. Um, and this, I mean, all the students did a really great job. Um, most everybody had a, a written out um, speech. Uh, that they had, you know, practiced and memorized real well and spoke very eloquently about what they thought about it. 
And I had not done that. I went last and completely winged it. I'd read the bill. I knew, I knew what, <laughs> I knew the issues that I had with the bill. Um, I had a sort of unique perspective. Um, be a, it was parents' rights bill, and I, I'm also a parent, also a student, but also a parent. So I hadn't heard that perspective come through um, fully as um, being a parent of elementary school kids, and it, that was what the bill was about. So I just, you know, I spoke to my personal experience with with teachers um, and parents, and you know, children being in school. So it was uh, it was exhilarating for me because uh, I am. Unlike many of you, not a natural extrovert. I am pretty introverted, and public speaking is not my thing. Um, but I really, like I said before, I really wanted this debate to go on. So I had a choice. I could either, you know, potentially see it not go on, or I could volunteer and just suck it up and talk in front of a bunch of people I didn't know. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I was, you know, it was... It was definitely nerve-wracking, but I got up and I and I said my piece, and um, I got a lot of good reception afterwards. People came up to me and they said, "Thank you for for sharing your perspective." Maybe they didn't have that, but uh, but uh, they appreciated the the difference of of opinions, the difference of looking at of this subject. Um, and so I, I took that home, and I was full of adrenaline all night, and it <laughs> it was uh, difficult going to sleep that night. But yeah, that's how Braver Angels found me, and that's why I'm here at this convention with all of you uh, this weekend, because um, I think it's just, it's it's a great idea to, to try to foster this healthy political discourse between people of a lot of unique perspectives. All right, thank you, Kayla. I think she should do public speaking more often, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have a star in the making. She just doesn't know it yet. Um, so if you're a student, and uh, we also have a special gathering for you later today. It's a student networking session in the grill on Lincoln, which is in the dining hall building, but um, the door on the left, not the main door. And so if you're a student, you are invited to that. And with that, I'd like to invite up one of uh, the most, very most exciting and passionate aspects of Braver Angels, um, uh, the music team. You're gonna hear a presentation that will energize you. Micah. Hello. This is so exciting to, to see everybody. Um, I am excited to be here with, uh, with Cameron and Eric and John and Cynthia, who spent much time on the music team as well. Um, you may have two questions. You may say, oh, I didn't know we had a music team. Or you may be saying, why do we have a music team? Um, and I'm hopeful that by the end of our, our, uh, our brief presentation that we and, and by the end of the convention, for sure, um, that we will have answered both of your questions. Um, just for us, I think the way that we have not only thinking think about it, but have seen um, is how music is critical to our movement because it adds a heart approach, not just a head approach to the work of depolarization. Um, and for, for me, I can't think of a successful social movement in history that didn't have music as one of its tools um, in terms of really trying to touch lives and galvanize change. Um, and so we do as well. Um, we've woven music, as you've already experienced, into each type of programming in this convention. We have performances in plenaries. We have the Common Ground songwriting track, which will be starting tomorrow. We have late night jam sessions every night, so we have little flyers outside the door for anyone who's interested in that. Tonight is Song Square. Um, and of course, the closing concert on Saturday night. Even the music that you hear before and after each of the plenaries was carefully crafted from our songwriter community. All of those songs are from within the Braver Angels movement um, and hopefully set the tone, if you will, in a nice way um, for the plenaries. 
Um, music has been a core part of Braver Angels since the very first Red Blue workshop in South Lebanon, Ohio, where the gathering's host, country music musician Richard Lynch and Peter Yarrow of Peter, Paul and Mary closed the opening gathering in song. And since then, our work has taken many forms, which my co-director John Carroll and the music team, Eric and Cameron, will also speak to now. Thanks. Hello. Woo. Woo. Hey, well, I just want to let you know, we recently wrapped up the 2023 Braver Angels Songwriting Contest. Woo! Yeah! Um, it, it injected a lot of excitement and energy into our ongoing songwriter community. I hope it injected a lot of energy into you, and if you are not excited yet, then you should be excited, because over 130 more songs are going to come to the catalog to be used for Braver Angels, uh, Braver Angels workshops, Braver Angels debates. We think it's just a really cool way of connecting artists who, with their passion and connecting you to those artists who are passionate about this work. I do wanna let you know that um, one of the important like philosophies and visions behind that song contest, uh, while we were proud to collect those songs, we also were trying to use it as a way to reach out to other creator communities and other creators. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that um, if we want to reach across to divisions, that we should uh, reach out to the voices and the artists and the creators and the cultural tastemakers um, who speak to those divisions. So um, yeah, I think that's gonna be an important aspect of our work going forward and Next aspect. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you, John. John put thousands of hours in making the song contest work along with our other uh, team members. So uh, one of our dreams uh, is to further develop and nurture a community of musicians and songwriters who support the mission of uh, Braver Angels to depolarize America through our artistry in our local communities in the internet and across the nation. Uh, Song Square, one of our program, uh, is an online time and space for songwriters to share the songs that they are working on and receive constructive feedback using our open art principles, which is a kind of a pointer for what makes a Braver Angel song. Also, it is a forum for discussion on relevant topics in the arts of songwriting as they may relate to the mission of Braver Angels. And we have been meeting on the third Sunday of every month since the 2020 Song Contest. Uh, so come and join us and share what you're working on. So, and in an effort, uh, oh, tonight we're gonna give you a sampling of Song Square uh, in, the, in the jam session. So come and hear new songs and covers and for the moments, right? Um, in an effort to integrate music in everything that Braver Angels does, we have a resource of recorded music through the generosity of our music community uh, that can be used in different Braver Angels workshops, meetings, and events. And sometimes we invite musicians to share live or online or in person in these events and programs. So growing and expanding our Braver Angels music community is essential to support the ever-growing Braver Angels movement. And if you want to listen to those songs, go to the um, uh, networking room in the gym. I hope it's open by now. And... Uh, at our table, which has not been set up yet because I couldn't get in, uh, there's, there's a QR code, giant QR code. You take a picture of it, that will take you to all the Braver Angel songs from the contest. Go and listen. I'm here to talk about another piece of Braver Angels music that you can also learn more about at our tables over in the gym later. Um, and that is the Kenosha Shindig, which happened for the first time last summer, 2022. Um, first meeting in person for all these folks up here, the Braver Angels music team. Um, and it was in my hometown of Kenosha, Wisconsin. You may remember our um, period of being in the news I am not a millennial and I need this paper. My phone just lost the text. Okay. 
I need this paper. Okay. So um, after the violence in Kenosha, we, we took that opportunity to have a common ground workshop with Reds and Blues who didn't already know each other in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And the, the topic was how best to rebuild the damage in uptown Kenosha. Um, and after the Common Ground workshop, we took those points of agreement that come out of the workshop and we went directly, after sharing a meal together, we went directly into a songwriting lab based on that common experience. And we wrote two new original songs with the help of these songwriter leaders, um, turning the, the participants in that Common Ground workshop, who weren't musicians at all, but we turned them into songwriters in that collaborative process, and then they performed with, again, the help of the musicians, um, in a concert the next night. And we'd like to export that model. So if that started wheels turning in your head, um, we would like to know about it. Everybody who witnessed any part of the three-day Kenosha Shindig left wanting more of it, and music was not just a metaphor for crossing boundaries. It was also a tool for crossing boundaries and strengthening community. So just to wrap up our presentation, you may be wondering why music is in the plenary about college campuses. Um, and the reason why is because expanding our work to college campuses is one of our key focus areas as we go forward. Um, and April and I have been having a lot of conversations about that, and Doug and I spoke about that also uh, today at length. Um, and because obviously music is an access point to the work of depolarization for folks who not only may not resonate with uh, immediately the idea of what we're doing, but may even be suspicious of it or think that it's bad. Um, and so music is often a way to humanize and get people um, in the room. Um, and as, um, as my co-director John Carroll loves to say, music lets us be different and music lets us be together. And Gangsta Grass, our artists in residence, proved that last night. Moni and her dad, Bernardo, proved that this morning in spades. And um, and I think it's that duality of individuality and also of unity across beliefs, backgrounds, and generations that we must hold if we're to build a successful movement, and music can let us do that. So we now have the chance to have a brief performance with uh, experiencing the magic of Ben Karen's song, who's one of the honorees from our song contest this year, um, and he will lead us all in his song, Together We Will Rise. Um, I just wanted to say that it's an incredible honor to be here with you all and really an honor to have this song chosen um, by the Braver Angels music team and everybody who adjudicated this. Um, Mike invited me to just share just a few words about this song. As he said earlier, um, every great social movement, I think, is uplifted and inspired by music. And so I started being in this movement with you all in 2016 and started working with Braver Angels in 2020. And this song was really born from and inspired by the work that we all do together. And my hope in writing it and my hope in performing it um, is that it can not only be a contemplation of what's at stake for us, but also a call to action to really rise to the occasion, which is a common theme that I've been hearing all morning. Um, and so if you uh, start to catch on to the chorus, but please do sing along with us because that's really what it's meant to be. Um, and the, the song is called Together We Will Rise. Tell me if we win this war, will we know the flag we're fighting for? Will we know the cost and whose reward will we? Tell me what does winning mean? Will we have the world we always dreamed? Will we recognize the sight of peace? Will we? And I know we're not the sins of our fathers. And I know we're not the broken hearts of our mothers. I 
know we can change this path, reclaim our last good chance to save our lives when we rise. One, two, a oh, one, two, three, four. The moment has come. Bury your pitchforks, your torches, and drums. The world we want for our daughters and sons will not be one at the end of a gun. The times are part of our neighbors and friends. Tell a new story and bring to an end. All of this madness and mass discontent. We are the ones, we're the ones who are sent. Here we go. We are the ones we've been waiting for. And we can stand to wait no more. We are united with open arms and eyes. Together we will rise. Make way for you, they're already prepared. Yes. Courage and truth are already there. Answers within them will soon come to bear. For all they need is to be made aware. It's time to move and it's time for each It's time to prove what humanity's worth. Those who were lost now will be seated first. For they're the ones who'll inherit the earth. We are the ones we've been waiting for, and we can stand to wait no more. We are united with open arms and eyes. Together we will rise. We will not ask for permission. We are the answer that's given. We are the ones who were written. We are the hope of the living. We are the ones we've been waiting for. And we can't stand away no more. We are united with open arms and eyes. Together we will rise. We are the ones we've been waiting for. And we can stand to wait no more. We are united with open arms and eyes. Together we will rise. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Ben Karen. Bravo! Thank you so much to everybody who performed with us tonight. Bravo, bravo! The music team, everybody, and Ben Karen. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that. I literally have goosebumps right now. Thank you. So last but not least, I'd like to introduce you to a very special individual. You saw him at the beginning on the screen. You will see him, I think, for the rest of your lives. His name is Manu Meal. He's uh, the CEO and president of Bridge USA. Also, um, you know, 30 under 30 and a bunch of other things that he'd rather I not say, but um, a friend and a colleague and our final speaker. Come up here and take us home. So April, it's, it's only fitting that you put me right after a song and right before everybody starts walking. This is a tough position. This is a tough position. Look, let's give a huge, huge round of applause for people that don't sing for the, the job, but sing for the passion. I mean, my God. I have to also tell you, I was nervous getting up here because I was with Wilk yesterday and I tripped over the wires already once. And so I've already won this. I've already won this. Look, um, I have so much gratitude, so much gratitude. I've, you know, right now, I was just sitting there, I was listening to the music, I was staring outside. I had a talk written and every time we do one of these things, it gets thrown out because we got to speak to the moment. I gotta speak to the moment. So here's the moment. Here's what I'm feeling. David Blankenhorn, when I first met him through April Lawson and then through Luke and through, through John Wood, he had a quote and, and some of the people 
that are here working for this work know this quote very well. It says, and it's in the, it's in the booklet, which is that one movement can't change the country, a movement, one, one organization can't change the country, a movement can. A movement can. We've got organizations like Starts With Us, we've got Listen First, we've got Braver Angels, we've got young people, we've got old people, we've got people all over. They're all represented here. And when April approached me to, to close this out right after the music, she was like, you know, want to talk about what, what actually gets us going? What, what motivates us? What drives us? David opened yesterday with, are we ready? We're ready. It's not even a question. We are ready. I approach this, this talk with the, the discipline that a college student approaches every paper with, which is I started yesterday morning. <laughs> On my march from the Best Western to Gettysburg College, 12 p.m., 85 degrees, hot, humid, but to Ross's point, walk into an AC room, two questions on my mind, and then I'm going to let you go. I want, to come, I want you to come on a journey with me. Two questions, two questions. First question on my mind. Why have this last 45 minutes to an hour? I mean, every minute you've got here is precious. Why, why spend time thinking about an intergenerational movement? That's a task. That's an aspiration. That's a really tough thing. Is it even necessary? Is it even necessary? I mean, young people don't vote that to those degrees. They're not in office to that extent. You know, older folks are, are as young people would say, stuck in their ideas. Everybody's got their flaws. What's the point of an intergenerational movement? And the second question, and this is the more important one in my mind, this is one that we need everybody here helping us solve. How do we get this movement to resonate in the hearts of the folks not here, but out there? That's the linchpin. That's the linchpin. So, why young people? 1960, four college freshmen from the North Carolina Agricultural and Technical Institute went to their local F.W. Woolworth store and sat on lunch counters. 1964, Mario Savio, UC Berkeley, stood in front of the Free Speech Movement Cafe talking about the necessity for dialogue and discourse, the necessity of human dignity, human values. 2015, a 15-year-old Swedish girl stood aside her parliament, demanded action. Greta Thunberg, doesn't matter what you think about these people, their ideas, the beliefs they stood for, the fact is that in each of these examples, Young people hold tremendous cultural power, while older folks hold tremendous material power. What if we combined the two? What if we combined the two? What if we combined the wisdom of the quote-unquote old with the curiosity of the quote-unquote young? You know what I'm about to do with you right now? We're going to take out those labels for a quick second. Robert F. Kennedy, two weeks before he got assassinated, had a quote, youth is not a time of life, it's a stage of mind. There's a lot of young old people out there. There's a lot of old young people. This is one generation. This is one generation. You feel, this is, everybody's curious. Everybody's energized. Everybody's got thoughts. Everybody's got ideas. So now the second question. What was my second question? How do we get this? I heard it. Resonate. Resonate. Resonate not with the hearts of the people here, but the people out there. Ross Irwin talked about this. Claire Ashcroft, Kayla, Anthony, um, Carson. You know, this is, this is a move. How do we get this to resonate out there? So when we think about this work, we often get the critiques. Let's take the flack, and then we're going to wrap this up. Let's take the flack. What are people telling you out there in the communities? This, this does not resolve issues. This doesn't solve problems. Is, as as I, think, I think it was Kayla said, it's, it's kumbaya, all of us sitting around. 
might have been Claire. It's us, it's us sitting around in circles, just having dialogues for the sake of having dialogues. It's for the privileged. It's, it's for the folks that can afford to have the conversation while those out there suffer the brutality of, of real oppression. But let's meet them where they are. Let's meet people where they are. I was one of those people whose hearts was not here. In fact, it was nowhere to be found. I was a pre-med student. I, I, <laughs> my mom's still confused. I was just with her, 48 hours, even just right now, she texted me, she said, what are you up to? I don't know, I'll, I'll let you tell her. So, Ross started the story, I'll end this. February 1st, 2017, again, my heart was not here, it was out there, 2017. In fact, again, as I said, I didn't, I didn't care about politics, democracy. I was, a, I was, you know, my parents immigrated to the United States. I was born in New Jersey, then I lived in India for some time. I came back here, moved around a bunch. February 1, 2017, we walk, walking back from a math seminar. And Ross said this, you know, hear helicopters flying overhead, windows shattering. I'm like, eh, Berkeley. <laughs> it is what it is. Turns out, I walk past this cafe. This cafe window is broken, right? It's broken, glass shattered. I look inside. I still have this photo on my phone. It said, CNN, UC Berkeley students protest free speech. Now, I didn't know what Berkeley any of that meant. All I just, CNN. And then the television crew filming that was sitting right next to me. And in that moment, I became not a spectator, but a participant. Next day, me and some random people, as Ross said, got together, we created a space for dialogue, just like you're doing here at Braver Angels, because our heart is in the place. What did that story tell me? Two things. One, when people say that this is, this is not only not meeting the moment, but in fact, it is counterproductive to our liberal brothers and sisters, we say, no, this is a theory of change. From Gandhi in the salt marches in 1945 to Dr. King, Harry Boyd's here, Professor Harry Boyd, Dr. King, 60s, civil rights, to Nelson Mandela, South Africa, 1995. They built movements, not on exclusion, but inclusion. Not on cynicism, but optimism. Not on tribalism, but individualism. Combined with a hope and an optimism that if somebody does not change, we got to get them there. That's to our liberals, brothers and sisters that criticize us for not being on the quote unquote side of change to our conservative brothers and sisters. I've never, ever come across work. And again, you can debate it. I'm 24. I haven't lived much of a life, so might be wrong. It's kind of a hypothesis, but you know, when you're talking, you got to make some assumptions. What I'm told by some amazing mentors of mine is this work is the most important bet on human dignity and human flourishing they've ever seen. In the, in the last session, in the last session, uh, John Wood Jr., someone who will rightfully take us home with the convention said, in conversation with Travis Smiley, I think was the name, Tavis. Really, really fascinating point. Define love, MLK definition of love, which was love means that you are worthy just because. The bridge building, listening to people, talking to people, that is the most significant bet on human dignity and flourishing. It is the most conservative principle I've ever heard of. Because to have a conversation, dialogue, you're betting on human nature. And that's what this government and that's what this ideal is built on. It's to protect the individuality and freedom of human nature. So to our liberal brothers and sisters, we're riding the waves of change. And to our conservative brothers and sisters, we're ensuring the strength of the human spirit. So this is what I'll close with. 
the conflict entrepreneurs, the divisive people, the people that are out there that are getting the clicks, that are getting the media, the people that are going to throw hate our way, they're going to throw toxicity our way, they're going to say you stand in the way of change or you stand in the way of conservative principles or liberal principles or you stand in the way, in the opposition of, of whatever they aspire for. We say this, while you continue to bet on the submissiveness of the human spirit, we, the courageous ones, the ones that are deciding to build bridges, not burn them, a much harder activity to do. We are going to bet on the strength of the human spirit, and not just that, but we are going to empower the braver angels of your nature, because that is the only way we build the world that we all need. Let's get to breakouts. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to give you breakout instructions, but just one final substantive note. The, uh, as you can see, Bridge USA is, uh, in my opinion, the single most compelling organization I've ever met in this space, maybe including ours. And our partnership with them is only deepening. And so it feels like we're one thing now, and that will only uh, deepen and grow over time. So, yes, that's a good thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, this is going to be the same as last time. There are people in the back who are going to uh, guide you to your breakouts. And um, I'm going to tell you, don't get up yet, but I'm going to tell you who they are. So, we have, if you're going to Glatfelter, Ryan. Ryan, where are you? He's in the back with the white sign near the double doors. If you're going to McCreary slash Science Center, I need Michelle. Um, Michelle, where are you? Michelle. All right, if you're going to McCreary and Science Center, um, go to Ross right there, who will be near the aisle. Um, if you're going to the atrium, follow Luke with the green sign, who will be over in that corner. And if you're going to uh, Masters, which also contains Mara, go with Sasha. Um, who has the pink sign in that corner. And remember, um, Mara is in Masters, uh, Dara and Bowen Auditoriums are in McCreary Science Center, and um, CUB is this building, and uh, the atrium is across the street. So we'll do our, our go ahead and close us, or sneeze first, that's fine, and we'll see you, <laughs> go ahead. Awesome. Well, this is a great session, everyone. Thank you so much. We hear that the next generation is here. They are ready to support. They will need our generations as well to bring it all home. So whether it's mentorship or sponsorship, as I heard earlier today, and or supporting this, bringing this to the schools you know, the teachers you know, the students you know, please do that. Um, and then know that tomorrow we will be back in this room again for our next plenary at 8.30 a.m. All the other sessions this afternoon are breakouts and special activities. See you tomorrow. 8.30 tomorrow morning. Back in this room. Call on recess. <laughs>